So everybody, we have a common kind of issue. There are a lot of people are unknown in the phone number wise. Uh, we ain't not able to match the video audio. So we may have to go out and just at, during the comments, we just have to let people go, go with 760 ending with 172, please make your comment. That will be the only way for us to move forward at this time since it's one o'clock. Is that okay? Um, in theory, although I think that opens the door for Zoom bombing. Right, so we just have to be careful and mute quickly. We just have to be on our toes when we get to that point. We're definitely having a lot of people that that are not registered on the spreadsheet and is showing up on the Zoom. Not a lot. We only have like, but, but and we should have only thirty-one. Looks like we have like forty-four. Right, be that and then audio. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, today, the Division of Drinking Water has prepared a white paper discussing economic feasibility analysis in consideration of an upcoming hexavalent chromium maximum contaminant level. The purpose of today's public hearing is to receive public comments and suggestions on that topic. Today's workshop will, will begin with a presentation by drinking water staff. Following the presentation, we will take a short break before we, be, we begin receiving your public comments. We ask that comments be kept to no more than two and a half minutes in length to help ensure that everyone interested in commenting is afforded that opportunity. Parties of like interests are encouraged to consolidate their comments. Please understand that today's public workshop is an opportunity for you, the public, to provide comments on the topic of economic feasibility at a public workshop. The State Water Board will not be taking any action on the issue of economic feasibility today. If you do not wish to provide your comments orally, you may also submit written comments today, or if you haven't already, you may submit your written comments following the instructions provided in the revised notice of opportunity for public comment and staff workshop. I also wanna let you know that this meeting is being webcast and recorded, so please speak clearly. In order to comply with public gathering limitations and physical distancing requirements, and is authorized by the governor's executive orders, there is no physical meeting room. For people who only want to listen or watch the meeting, the State Water Board's customary webcast is available at video.calipa.ca.gov. The presentation and white paper are available by sending an email request to ddwregunit at waterboards.ca.gov with 427 presentation as the subject line. In addition, we are receiving public comment through a Zoom meeting platform. If you intend to comment or think you might be interested in commenting, you should already be in the Zoom meeting room using the meeting ID provided on the board's website and the password you received from our regulatory development unit. If you have not already received a password, you can email the unit at ddwreg at unit or sorry, excuse me, ddwregunit at waterboards.ca.gov. Include economic feasibility white paper in the subject line so Division of Drinking Water staff can follow up with you. In the email, please include your name and organization, whether you, are, you will participate via Zoom video or by phone, and if calling in, please provide the last three digits of your phone number so that we can easily identify you. When joining the Zoom meeting via phone or computer, you will be placed in a virtual meeting room until admitted. You will be able to watch and hear this, the meeting, but you will be on mute and your camera turned off until it is your turn to speak. When it is your turn to speak, the meeting moderator will then prompt you to unmute your microphone and ask you to turn on your camera if you wish. When you are done speaking, you will be placed on mute and your camera turned off.
you can remain in the Zoom meeting until the completion of your comment and then may choose to exit the meeting or continue. Please note that to maintain the integrity of the meeting, several Zoom features, including the chat function, have been turned off for this workshop. For those watching through the webcast or Zoom, staff have included information regarding internet available documents in the presentation. If you would like to submit comments regarding the proposed regulations, they must be submitted to the board clerk no later than 12 noon on Friday, May 15th. Please refer to the revised notice for how to submit written comments. We will also provide this information in the presentation. This workshop will begin with a staff presentation by Mark Bartson, Supervising Sanitary Engineer over the Division of Drinking Water's Technical Operations section. Thank you, Scott. We're live now. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the Division of Drinking Water's workshop. We're here today to, to discuss our white paper on economic feasibility for developing a maximum contaminant level for hexavalent chromium. My name is Mark Bartson. I'm the chief of the techn technical operations section of the Division of Drinking Water. <clears throat> I've been in this role since 2008, which included the development of the MCL for hexavalent chromium in 2013 and 2014. <clears throat> My contact information is on this slide. I've also included the contact information of Robert Brownwood, the branch chief of the program management branch, my boss, as well as Melissa Hall, who heads up the regulatory development unit. Melissa is here in person with me in the room, along with Scott. So there's three of us here today in this room. We're here in the Cal EPA building in downtown Sacramento, about three blocks from the state capitol. I have Scott on my right and Melissa on my left. We have our IT person on the other side of the wall to help us if need be, but if all goes well, we won't hear from him at all. At the bottom of this page is a link to the hexavalent chromium DDW webpage. You can find current information as well as history and background on the development of the maximum contaminant level for hexavalent chromium. So our agenda for today. This meeting is all about public comment, but we do want to explain our white paper. You've heard some introduction, you've heard how to register for oral comments. We'll have a chance to hear some of that again as we go to our break before the public comment period. So the staff presentation, which I will do, will last probably about a half an hour, maybe a little bit less. We'll take a short break of up to 10 minutes to coordinate the logistics of the Zoom platform, make sure we have everybody on our list who would like to speak. About 3.15, we'll do a time check to see how we're doing with the queue and how many people remain to speak. <clears throat> We'd like to get to everybody today. We plan to end at 4 o'clock or thereabouts to end the public comment period. So with that, let's get started. <clears throat> First of all, thanks to all of you for being here today. And thank you for, to Melissa and Scott for being here in the room with me. I came down here the other day and practiced by myself. Believe me, it's a pretty strange experience to be in a room that's designed for 250 people all by myself. So very happy to have Scott and Melissa here with me and all of you listening in. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you find our presentation both informative and I hope you enjoy the public comment period and find it uh, gives you a chance to hear what others have to say as well as to comment yourself if you have something to say. I believe we have about 30 people signed up already so we have plenty of feedback that we'll be hearing. So background information. My presentation here today has three sections. Background information, a recap of major points from the white paper, and a review of the Administrative Procedures Act process, which we'll follow in developing the regulations. So the first set, section on background information, we've designed this to provide background on the some of the overall issues as well as some of the terms we use in the white paper, some of the foundational elements of our thinking in developing the white paper. This will be the second MCL developed by the State Water Board since the transfer of the drinking water program from the California Department of Public Health to the State Water Board in 2014. The first was the 2017 adoption of the maximum contaminant level for 123 trichloropropane. Many of the staff who worked on that MCL package are working on the current MCL development. So about the document itself, 
It's a 13 page document, relatively brief, developed by state water board staff. The purpose of the document is to explore the topic of economic feasibility from the state water board staff perspective. This is specifically related to the MCL for hexavalent chromium. In the document, we consider statutory authorities and statutory requirements, along with experience and lessons learned from the development of previous MCLs. We discuss the statutory mandates in detail, the technical challenges and the practical considerations that go into the economic feasibility analysis are also considered. So the white paper has eight sections. There's an introduction, a se section on the statutory requirements for establishing an MCL, the California specific requirements that go beyond what's required by the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, but are within the California Safe Drinking Water Act. There's a discussion of the state water board process for the development of the MCL, some of the mechanics of the calculations and the, and the methodology. Limited discussion, but discussed in enough detail to get the gist of it. A lengthy section on the limitations of the cost benefit analysis. Section five, we call the small water system economic feasibility dilemma, which gets a lot of play and ties into the whole issue of economy of scale, which under, um, is underscored throughout our our white paper. There's a look at the consideration of incremental costs in establishing an MCL, a look at affordability and economic feasibility, and a fairly brief con conclusion section. We make it clear in the conclusion that our evaluation, analysis, and discussion of economic feasibility will be multi multifaceted. The details of what that will look like depend in part on what we hear today. We are here to listen. The purpose of the workshop and the white paper is stated from in the document itself. The state water board would like to engage stakeholders in what additional information should be considered in the development of this maximum contaminal, contaminant level, specifically related to the issue of economic feasibility. <clears throat> Your comments will be considered in the development of the MCL. We want feedback on the suggestions and ideas in the document as well as your own ideas and suggestions. And we have extended the public comment period to May 15, 2020 at noon. How will we use the comments we received today? My staff and I will read all comments. We will summarize, share, and consider them within our program and with division managers within the State Water Board. So first, what is that uh, hexavalent chromium? Chromium is a heavy metal that occurs throughout the environment. The trivalent form, commonly known as chromium-3 or trivalent chromium, is a required nutrient with very low toxicity. In fact, it's, essential, it's an essential nutrient. The hexavalent form, also known as chromium-6 or hexavalent chromium, is much more toxic and is known to cause cancer when inhaled. Studies in lab animals link ingestion of hexavalent chromium to cancer as well. So just a few numbers. We have developed a list of what we call at-risk systems under at a number equal to the previous maximum contaminant level of 10. Through our analysis, it, at this time, there are 526 sources, drinking water sources, wells essentially, with at least one result greater than 10 parts per billion. 452 of, the, of these sources belong to community water systems, and 74 of them belong to non-transient, non-community systems. I'll talk about those categories of water systems in a moment, provide some definitions. These 526 sources belong to 238 public water systems. Of those public water systems, 175 are community water systems and 63 of them are non-transient, non-community systems. Some of these sources may or may not be in service. This is based on a single sample, just to give you an idea of the scale. There were approximately 168 systems that incurred violations under the previous MCL when it was in fact prior to being invalidated. I want to talk about the public health goal. So what is the public health goal? First of all, the public health goal is foundational to our process. The California Safe Drinking Water Act of 1996 requires the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, sometimes known as OEHA, to perform risk assessments and adopt public health goals for contaminants in drinking water based exclusively on public health considerations. 
public health goal is a level of chemical contaminant in drinking water that does not pose a significant risk to health. For cancer-causing chemicals, OEHA typically establishes a public health goal at the one in a million risk level. At the public health goal, not more than one person in one million people drinking the water daily for 70 years would be expected to develop cancer as a result of that exposure. Public health goals are not regulatory standards. The public health goals do consider the synergistic effects from other chemicals exposure, from other chemicals. They consider adverse health effects on sensitive subgroups such as infants, children, pregnant women, and the elderly, and the additive effects in exposure from other sources such as food, air, and the environment in general. The public health goal does not consider economics or cost. That's what we get to do in developing an MCL. A brief recap of the hexavalent chromium timeline. So in July of 2011, OEHA released the final public health goal report for hexavalent chromium, establishing the current public health goal. In August of 2013, the California Department of Public Health which was where the drinking water was, program was located prior to 2014, proposed a maximum contaminant level. A couple of steps in the process occurred in April of 2014 and May of 2014, before July of 2014, when the MCL became effective at a level of 0 0.010 milligrams per liter. That number is, was the official MCL at the time, which in this paper, we typically use 10 micrograms per liter or parts per billion. The MCL was challenged and eventually invalidated by the Superior Court of California in May of 2017. The decision was based on the court finding that we had, quote, failed to properly consider the economic feasibility of complying with the MCL. Some full-scale treatment for hexavalent chromium has been installed and is in operation in several water systems. Now I wanna to touch upon a uh, public water system types, it's sort of a refresher for many of you, but it's an important distinction. There's basically three types of public water systems that we refer to, the community, the non-transient non-community, and the transient non-community. The top two categories in the green box, the community and non-transient community, are subject to the monitoring requirements, the maximum contaminant level that will be established under these regulations. The transient non-community systems consistent with other regulations are not required to monitor and meet the standard. The community water systems serve year-long residents, specifically 25 or more, or at least 15 service connections. And you can see in the far right-hand column that there's approximately 2,900 of those statewide. The non-transient, non-community systems serve at least 25 of the same people over six months per year. Those typically include schools, larger places of employment with 25 or more employees and similar. The community water systems typically include water district cities, mobile home parks, all with their own sources of water. Now the final category are the transient non-community systems. There's about 3,000 of those statewide. They're public water systems that serve at least 25 people at least 60 days per year, but typically no year long residents or certainly less than 25. So the number breakdown again is statewide 2,900 community systems, 1,500 non-community, non-transient non-community, and about 3,000 transient non-community systems. <clears throat> I wanted to mention the human right to water because that's foundational to our work going forward on economic feasibility. We refer to the human right to water in our white paper Signed into law in 2012, the human right to water recognizes that every human has the right to safe, clean, affordable, and accessible water, adequate for human consumption, cooking, and sanitary purposes. In 2016, the State Water Board adopted a resolution identifying the human right to water as a top priority and core value of everything we do. <clears throat> the human right to water law is part of the landscape in taking a deeper look at affordability and economic feasibility. This particular tool is available on our website, the Human Right to Water page. The tool allows you to look broadly at the big picture like this. It also allows you to zoom in on particular communities and regions. Now granted, from a look like this, you, the stars and the dots pile on top of each other. 
But using this tool, you can zoom in to your local level. You can also download the data sets. The red stars here represent water systems with violations in community water systems or schools of the grand total of 7,400 pub public water systems statewide. So how well are community water systems doing and meeting current drinking water standards? Well, some of the numbers can be gathered from this page. <clears throat> For example, analysis of the data available reveals that 90% of water quality violations, maximum contaminant levels, occur in water systems serving fewer than 500 service connections. Also, the larger community water systems serving greater than 3,300 connections, although they only represent 15% of the total number of systems, serve about 95% of the population served by community water system. <clears throat> that was referenced in our um, white paper document. A little more background here on the distribution of community water system sizes. <clears throat> this slide shows the distribution of community sizes statewide. Along the bottom axis, you see the size categories that were developed for this particular graph. Less than 25 service connections, less than 50, and so on, breaking down into fairly small groups. <clears throat> the bars show the cumulative total across all of the size categories. <clears throat> the issue of economy of scale becomes difficult, at smaller water system sizes, of course. Regardless of size, community water systems of all sizes share specific responsibilities related to economic feasibility mentioned in our document. Public water system managers and decision makers are stewards of customer health and financial sustainability of the system. Rate stu structures must be equitable and sufficiently cover the immediate operation and maintenance costs as well as the long-term needs. And protection of public health and maintaining that protection is an absolute priority. The point I want to make with this map is taking a look at the question of how small are most small water systems? How small is small? How small are they? <laughs> so from this graph, you can see from the arrow coming across at the 50% line, that represents half of the total number of community water systems. Half of the total number, the total number is 2,700, so about 1,350, serve fewer than 100 homes fairly small systems. Later you will see how we categorize public water systems by size in the development of the previous MCL and how we might approach that going forward. In the white paper we discuss size categories to make different points. Smaller systems overall have a higher level of violation by far. Economy of scale is the underlying problem but there are many additional factors that go beyond that to consider. So hexavalent chromium by the numbers. I included this table just to review some of the numbers that we toss around both in our conversation here today and in the white paper on hexavalent chromium. First of all, there is in place an MCL for total chromium, which includes all forms of chromium. The MCL at the state level is 50 micrograms per liter. The previous MCL, as mentioned, was 10 micrograms per liter. The next number, the two, is the health protective level for non-cancer effects, which is established in the public health goal report. We mentioned that paper in our white paper makes some specific points related to that number and potential MCL values. One is the detection level for reporting established by the previous regulatory package, the previous MCL. It's a lower lim limit, essentially, for MCL evaluation. And finally, the public health goal of 0.02. Again, that's based on a one in a million theoretical lifetime cancer risk. As a result, the range of values to be considered for the new MCL is essentially between one and 50. That value is established once again by the lower limit for MCL evaluation, which is the detection level for reporting. Now we'll be looking at that again, but that was a number previously established. So what are some of the considerations as we go through our evaluation of potential MCL values and consider lower and lower values to protect public health? Well, from a technical point of view, there's questions such as what concentration does cost increase dramatically, if any? Are there inflection points? What are the technical limitations of each technology? At what point does operational complexity become too great? 
And of course, what are the various cost factors, including operation and maintenance? So here I'm going to move to recap of the major points from the white paper. Scott, everything going well technically? Okay, great. Thanks for being here, by the way. And for those of you who joined us a little bit late, you'll have a chance. We'll be taking the public, starting the public comment period at about 1.50. But right before that, you'll get, have a chance to hear how you can still go about um, signing up for the public comment. So moving into section two, the white paper itself. <clears throat> I have a series of slides designed to highlight the main points from the white paper, focusing on the statutory requirements, but moving through some of the questions we developed in the white paper itself. First, the statutory requirements, the health and safety code, the things that go beyond the federal safe drinking water and were established by the California legislature in view of the obvious benefits of safe drinking water. The first section from the Health and Safety Code is 116270. It's a policy of the state to reduce to the lowest level feasible all concentrations of toxic chemicals that when present in drinking water may cause cancer, birth defects, and other chronic diseases. Second major statutory requirement is under section 116365. A primary drinking water standard adopted by the state board shall be set at a level that is close, is as close as feasible to the corresponding public health goal, placing primary emphasis on the protection of health, but considering technological and economic feasibility. And finally, this section from one section from Health and Safety Code 116365, which states that in determining economic feasibility, the state water board is required to consider the cost of compliance to public water systems customers and other affected parties with the proposed primary drinking water standard, including the cost per customer and the aggregate cost of compliance using best available technology. So basically this establishes a process in which we assume that every water system with a, a source that exceeds a given potential MCL value will install treatment. We evaluate the cost of that treatment. And we go through this process of per customer and the aggregate cost calculation. So clearly the health and safety code requires a consideration of cost, of course. We intend to expand the discussion of costs, but we do, did want to make it clear that the State Water Board does not perform a traditional cost-benefit analysis, as many people conceive it, in which costs and benefits both would be put in a monetary value. We don't do that. <clears throat> so to establish an MCL that is economically feasible, in the paper, we conclude that it's best to take a multifaceted approach to looking at economic feasibility when setting drinking water standards, considering multiple lines of evidence. What does that mean? So looking, for one thing, looking deeper at the non-cancer health impacts and having at least a qualitative discussion of those impacts, qualitative discussion of the, of the quality of life issues. <clears throat> and also looking at affordability in different ways as discussed in the white paper, and perhaps drawing on the work of WEHA in their 2019 Human Right to Water report, draft report mentioned in the white paper and other studies that are currently underway. <clears throat> Is it? Get me back to one slide there. So slide 26 is a fairly, is a point we make in our white paper in discussing the small water system economic feasibility dilemma. A series of points actually that taken together are some of the stronger statements we make in the report. First of all, setting new or revised standards based only on what is economically feasible for the most disadvantaged public water systems will restrict the development of new or more protective standards. Also establishing economic feasibility criteria based on less than 5% of the state pop population jeopardizes health protection for the remaining 95% and is not an acceptable public health policy. 
And finally, statewide protection of public health should not be limited to what is affordable to the smallest systems. <clears throat> So in this slide, I wanted to go through how we are process for the technical and financial evaluation of the cost numbers we generate, that is for potential MCL values as discussed in the white paper. The part of this table outlined in red takes the values from our previous MCL package. <clears throat> You'll see along the left-hand column, potential MCL values that were evaluated, considered at the time from 0 0.01, one microgram per liter up to 30. Across the top, you see the service size, the size categories that were considered for purposes of making that analysis. Less than 200 service connections, 200 to 999, 1,000 to 10,000, and so on. And the cost numbers generated are shown there and aggregated within the group. <clears throat> now for this, this go around and developing the MCL, we can choose different size categories. We could choose some, um, smaller below 200 categories. We have various ways of doing that. That's something for consideration. The numbers were based on available information on treatment technologies and costs at that time. We will be generating and have generated, generated new numbers. We will be considering additional concepts such as considering levels of, multi, of median household income as suggested in the white paper. These new concepts can add new dimensions to the discussion. The column on the far right was not in the previous MCL development package, but is something we suggested in the white paper where we would calculate for purposes of consideration the weighted average annual cost per connection for all impacted system at various MCLs. So basically an aggregate of the aggregate. This was used to illustrate a way of looking at affordability across a larger group of systems as one consideration amongst others. The cost figures in this table for the smallest group of water systems are in the range of 500 per month on the lowest levels. That's a concern, obviously. These were the costs for treatment, but there are alternatives to treatment. How do we best evaluate and discuss options and associated costs of option, options other than treatment? No, first of all, not all, systems, not all systems will install centralized treatment. Non-treatment alternatives are often best for smaller systems such as consolidation, regionalization, or developing a new source. So related to affordability, here are some of the highlights of our thinking, open for discussion. There will be a balance between adding new factors to consider and managing the complexity of our analysis. We do have a lot of information available, plus a lot of thought has been put into the issue of portability. So good, it's a good chance to hear your thoughts on the topic. We recognize affordability is an issue with small, uh, related not just to small water systems. We now have a dedicated group program to develop approaches to address affordability in our SAFER program, the Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience in drinking water. So as a program, we're looking at affordability more broadly than this, although the focus today is specific to hexavalent chromium. So what are some of the potential indicators? Using indicators of affordability developed by Ahuiha, as I mentioned earlier, and then the white paper, related to median household income of communities. These can include the water cost burden for a particular amount of water, by the median household, or the household with the median income, I should say. <laughs> Further evaluation of economically vulnerable subpopulations within a water system by comparing water bills. These are two kind of new concepts. By comparing water bills to county poverty levels or the deeper poverty levels, as explained in the OEHA report. Another suggestion is comparing the incremental cost of treatment to the median household income in communities. And finally, as mentioned, the further assessment of affordability is underway as an element of our SAFER program for the long term.
Thank you, Scott. So what are some of the factors in determining health impact? Well, first of all, from the public health goal, we have the health effects identified for cancer specifically and a qualitative discussion of the non-cancer impact. Exposure to contaminant, the contaminant can be assessed based on source water quality monitoring data. We have monitoring data. Cancer health impacts can be quantified in the way that we do it. We've done it previously with a the theoretical lifetime cancer risk over the population impacted by a potential MCL. On the white paper, we discussed that non-cancer health impacts cannot really be quantified. <clears throat> and neither the cancer or the can non-cancer or the cancer health impacts can be monetized. We don't have a way to do that. What are some of the challenges in evaluating costs? Well, determining the cost of installing and operating treatment systems to remove hexavalent chromium. We have good information on that. Determining incremental cost to consumers' water bills, that gets more challenging to do that at a granular level. The third thing is one of the big challenges. Consumers may also be impacted by healthcare and related costs. How could healthcare savings be considered in evaluating economic feasibility, even if only a qualitative discussion? And again, how should quality of life issues that impact families, communities, and societies be considered in evaluating economic feasibility? Our conclusion from the white paper is, again, economic feas feasibility will be a multifaceted, largely qualitative process with some quantitative elements, of course. So I wanted to move on to a review of our Administrative Procedures Act process. I'll check with Scott here. Looks like we're doing okay with time so far. Okay, great. So in establishing a maximum contaminant level, we follow the Administrative Procedures Act process. Specifically, the Water Board process includes these elements, the State Water Board workshops, fiscal and economic impact assessments, the standardized regulatory impact assessment, California Environmental Quality Act, scientific peer review, Department of Finance, the specifics of the Administrative Procedure Act, and the State Water Board consideration for adoption. And finally, OAL review. Now we've been through this process here at the Water Board for 123 trichloropropane. So we've learned a lot about the process, how to best approach peer review, how to do the standardized regulatory impact for maximum contaminant levels. So that's very helpful. Some of the factors we'll consider in evaluating to evaluate in MCL development are the health effects but within the public health goal report and the health protective levels, both cancer and non-cancer our ability to detect and quantify the detection level for reporting and methods, the occurrence data from groundwater and surface water, treatability, treatment costs and variables, and the best available technology. So in the category of good news, what additional information do we have now? We have occurrence data, a more complete data set compared to 2012. We have cost and performance information from full-scale treatment system. There's other treatment technologies that are that are available, although, although not yet to full scale, public water systems may propose to use technology other than best available technologies. A full scale use of alternative technologies such as these is reviewed by, by the drinking water permit process. Also the POU point of use, point of entry regulations have been adopted for smaller systems. Systems serving, serving fewer than 200 service connections may consider this for compliance if centralized treatment is not immediately economic feasible. I wanted to mention other Cal, uh, state of California, Cal EPA and state water resources control board work related to affordability that's underway. I mentioned earlier the human right to water established um, by AB 685 in 2012, which recognized the human right to water in 2019 Options were developed by the State Water Board um, Office of Research Planning and Performance for Low Income Water Rate Assistance Program as authorized by the, uh, as required by statute to develop those options. In July of 2019, SB 200 funded the SAFER program, the Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience Drinking Water Program. In August of 2019, OEHA issued its draft report on achieving the human right to water this includes 
uh, data tools for assessing affordability. And finally, in June of next year, our Division of Drinking Water, the State Water Board, is undertaking a water system needs analysis report to look deeper at the big picture. And finally, a discussion of our timeline as we presented to the State Water Board at our March regulatory update. Obviously, we had three workshops scheduled. We've This web-based workshop is replacing those. The bottom couple bullets on the slides show the overall timeline of, of when we anticipating getting this maximum contaminant level to the notice of pro proposed rulemaking, which would be spring of 2020, 20, 2021, about a year from now to get through the whole process. There'll be workshops along the way. So again, you can submit written comments on the white paper until May 15th by email, mail, or in person, the procedures here. And we're gonna be moving to the public comment period now. So we'll um, take that about a 10 minute break. I think we're right on schedule, Scott. So we'll need about 10 minutes for logistics. So bear with us and we'll go get to our public comment period. I hope this was informative and thanks for your attention. And thanks to Scott and Melissa. So we'll be back online in 10 minutes. If you would like to comment and you are in the Zoom room, make sure that you have a number next to your name as well as your organization and your name. If you don't see that, if you're calling from a phone number or if you are, if you have a please identify yourself in your name, please send us an email uh, so that we can identify you. Uh, if we are unable to identify you, you'll be at the back of the queue and you may not have an opportunity to speak. So it's really important that we can identify you. Thank you.
I might prefer a longer arm. For the folks that are in the Zoom room, uh, if you have, please identify your name as part of your name. Please send us an email with your name, organization, and your current username on Zoom. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone that wants to get an opportunity to speak is allowed to today. However, if we can't identify you, you will be placed at the very end of the queue. Uh, and you may not have an opportunity to speak due to time constraints. Additionally, for those people with phone numbers, uh, we have about six people with phone numbers that we don't have, uh, we can't match them. So if your phone number begins area code 562 and ends in 200, please identify yourself via email. Um, 760 area code, last three digits 172 needs to identify themselves. Area code 760, last three digits 800, needs to identify themselves. Area code 760, last three numbers 967. Area code 831, last three digits 915. Please identify yourselves by, by email to the email address listed uh, on the website and in the slides right now. Thank you very much. Our first speaker is going to be Chad Seidel from Corona Environmental Consulting. Chad, I'm going to unmute you right now and ask you to share your video if you prefer, and you'll have five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can hear me well. Great. Thank you to the Water Board and our colleagues at Aqua and the Southern California Water Coalition for the opportunity to speak with you all today. We all understand this is a key issue and share the importance of protecting public health while also considering technical and economic feasibility. So while the board is seeking input on the economic feasibility white paper specific to the development of an MCL for hectavalent chromium, we understand and recommend that the ideas and the methodologies arising from this be applied in the development of future drinking water standards. And given this importance, continued iteration between the board and the public is warranted beyond just this verbal comment opportunity today and the May 15, 2020 comment period deadline. As alluded to in the board's white paper, economic feasibility is a complex, multifaceted issue that requires consideration of a range of analytical tools and associated metrics. And we agree with the point that the board raises that no single method or metric is sufficient. However, a haphazard approach that may vary appreciably across potential rulemakings is not a sound methodology for establishing prudent standards to protect public health. Rather, we believe that the board needs to develop a systematic and consistent framework not a formula, using multiple methods and metrics for evaluating the economic feasibility of future potential drinking water standards. This approach should be structured around the following two sequence questions. First, do the proposed MCLs or other standards or policies being considered provide benefits to justify the costs? And second, if benefits are deemed to exceed or otherwise justify the costs, then ask the question, is the MCL affordable? 
So benefit cost analysis is a necessary step in determining whether an MCL is a sound investment in public health protection. It addresses the core question of whether a potential MCL appears to be a worthwhile investment of the public's monies in public health protection statewide. Benefit cost analysis also helps incrementally consider the possible choices of MCLs. As increasingly stringent MCLs are considered, benefit cost analysis answers the question, at what point do costs start to accelerate relative to a limited gain in additional public health benefit? And we note that the health risk reduction benefits are difficult to fully quantify or monetize and are typically subject to considerable uncertainty. And a comprehensive accounting of public health benefits is desirable, but not necessary in order to perform a benefit cost analysis. With respect to affordability, there's an ongoing national dialogue on the challenge that rising costs for water-related services pose for community and household affordability. And affordability, affordability challenges must therefore be given careful consideration in the evaluation of potential MCLs. As described by the board, several agencies, organizations, and experts have put forth various metrics for assessing household affordability. And we agree with the board that no one metric or threshold is sufficient as a decision rule for identifying affordability concerns. We therefore recommend that the board apply a range of relevant metrics that can together indicate the extent to which affordability is a concern. Metrics should be applied to individual communities and across system sizes. And affordability considerations should be evaluated across viable treatment technologies and other applicable compliance strategies. Affordability analysis should not be limited to just the best available technology. Instances when the use of a best available technology will not be feasible for a system need to be identified. And costs of non-treatment options, such as source water blending or well modification or system consolidation should be considered alongside treatment costs to identify the instances when non-treatment approaches are feasible and less expensive than treatment. Additionally, the board can readily determine the number of affected water systems, community water systems, and the corresponding population connections that they serve that are designated as disadvantaged communities, DACs, or severely disadvantaged communities, SDACs, consistent with the methodology adopted by state agencies. And to the extent that state funding, whether it be through grants or loans, is identified as a means to address system needs when solutions are not affordable, the board should establish that the funding or financing sources uh, have the capacity to accommodate associated demands or needs and is therefore an economically feasible solution. You know, we note the board's new safe and affordable fund for equity and resilience program, otherwise known as SAFER, that is working to meet the goals of safe, accessible, and affordable drinking water for all Californians considering current MCLs. And this dialogue about economic feasibility of potential future MCLs for contaminants such as hexavalent chromium will certainly impact the SAFER program and other corresponding efforts and must be considered in the white paper going forward. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I look forward to submitting our written comments and continuing the dialogue with the board and stakeholders. Thank you for your comment, Chad. We'll next be hearing from Jackie McLeod from the city of Watsonville. Uh, Jackie, I'm going to unmute you and ask you to share your video. Are you able to hear me okay? Oh. Yep, thumbs up. I'm getting a thumbs up from the podium. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, board members, Department of Drinking Water staff, and members of the public that are participating. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the workshop. My name is Jackie McLeod, and I serve as the Senior Utilities Engineer for the City of Watsonville, a state-recognized disadvantaged community that serves approximately 1,500 service connections. We serve a population that is 100% disadvantaged, with approximately 20% of our residents living below the federal poverty level. I'm here to provide a comment on the economic feasibility as it relates to systems serving disadvantaged communities like mine, which the court addressed in their invalidation of the previous standard for hexavalent chromium. We support the positions laid out by the court ruling objecting to the elimination of small systems when considering cost impacts, because even though we may not be a, considered a small system, we share the similar cost implications to that of a small system. Our system represents some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged communities in the state, 
and should be steering the conversation of economic feasibility for the maximum contaminant limit. But the white paper indicates that we won't even be involved in the discussion. The white paper treats poor people like a burden to wealthier residents for whom cost is not a factor in reducing risk for, from suspected contaminants. Our communities cannot afford an increase in cost on their monthly statements. The white paper's conclusions would either eliminate the consideration of small systems or create an averaging of all costs together to determine economic feasibility. This blatantly disregards the court opinion that invalidated the previous MCL because of the uneven burden it would place on small systems. The Water Board's report on the establishment of a LIR system as part of AB 401 speaks to the needs of vulnerable communities in the state and should be incorporated in the white paper. It's also concerning that the AB 401 report to the state legislature, pardon me, providing options for the establishment of a LIR program was authored by the same consultant who drafted the white paper on economic feasibility. Together, they suggest that economic feasibility, affordability, and even the ability to pay are similar to the chicken or the egg puzzle. Which came first does not really matter because the end result is we have a chicken. We cannot have a regulatory process that renders treatment requirements that are so expensive, as was the case for hexavalent chromium, that the lack of economic feasibility results in the lack of affordability and the ability of our poorest residents to pay a reasonable rate for their water. As a result of these concerns, we urge the State Water Board to consider the court's opinion that our system's costs should, should be separately identified and calculated before being added into the analysis, especially in communities that are small and or entirely disadvantaged. The white paper also dismisses the concerns of small and poor communities by highlighting grant and technical assistance programs, where there is a disparity between the reports on financial assistance that are provided to the State Water Board and what is actually happening to communities like mine on the ground where the eligibility and program criteria are ambiguous. Communities can spend thousands of dollars on grant writers and engineers to fill an application for a state grant, only to later learn that systems such as the size of ours are not eligible, despite serving a community that is 100% disadvantaged. It is even more complicated when a community like Watsonville is asked by the state to consolidate small water systems around us because at times we may be pressed to accept loans from the state whose costs would have to be passed on to our already distressed rate payers. We support board member McGuire's idea that even when the state water board adopts a standard for hexavalent chromium, that there also will be in place a strategy for deploying grants and technical assistance to impacted systems that need help. To adopt such a strategy with an overall policy on economic feasibility, the outcome of the workshop and written comments should go back to the board for consideration and adoption. This workshop should not be a dead-end discussion about economic feasibility that, as the white paper suggests, continues the practice of ignoring the needs of small water systems in disadvantaged communities. To do so only exposes the state to future invalidations of standards and uncertainty and wasted financial resources by water systems struggling to comply, fearing penalties, and later invalidated by the court. Thank you for the opportunity to share our comments. We're all having to balance health and our residents, especially in light of COVID. So we appreciate the time today. We hope the board considers our recommendations on the economic feasibility consistent with the court ruling for setting an MCL standard, which can help to avert the race to the bottom for water systems serving disadvantaged communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Next, we'll be hearing from Ray Collis from the 29 Palms Water District. Ray, I've unmuted you, and if you have a video, you can use it. I have no video. Uh, good afternoon to everybody on this call today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to contribute my comments at this workshop. Again, my name is Ray Kolish. I represent the 29 Palms Water District as the general manager. I am chair to the Community Water System Alliance, representing water districts that serve disadvantaged communities from the Central Coast to the high desert in Southern California, where 29 Palms Water is located. Our system serves a population that is 100% disadvantaged with 75% of that severely disadvantaged. We appreciate the efforts the state has made to help address public health concerns related to chromium-6, and I am here to provide a comment on the feasibility discussion as it relates to disadvantaged communities like mine, which the court addressed. When reading through the white paper, I was drawn to the discussion of affordability. 
The white paper asserts that there is currently no agreed upon standard for determining affordability and that the connection between affordability and economic feasibility is beyond the scope of the white paper. The Water Board's consultant report suggests that protection of public health is an absolute priority and it is up to public water systems to develop budgets and water rates necessary for a sustainable water system. Although I applaud the board's transparency, I am disappointed that the paper writes off affordability as beyond the reach of this study in clear violation of the court's mandate as the water board looks to create a new MCL for chromium six. It's my belief that not considering affordability can end up meaning that my system's customers have to face higher water rates for water. If my customers can't pay their bills because of drinking water standard, that also makes it infeasible for our water system to afford the required treatment. Affordability and economic feasibilities are interrelated because one can easily cause the other. Many customers have told me that they are living paycheck to paycheck and increasing costs will be difficult to handle as they afford life essentials like housing and food. The State Water Board must address the court's mandate of evaluating economic feasibility and it can begin by creating mechanisms that allow disadvantaged communities to comply without incurring the stigma that goes when we cannot afford treatment method, methods used in affluent areas of California. For example, when the standard for arsenic was set by the US EPA agencies were given five years to comply. During those five years, larger systems implemented technologies driving down costs. In the meantime, that made it feasible for 29 Palms Water to devise methods to regenerate treatment media that further drove down costs, making it affordable. Yet in California, the state water board has refused to even consider such timelines, ironically by claiming that its priority is protecting public health. But how can that be when poor people can't afford the remedies? We also agree that the state water board can adopt a strategic plan when adopting new standards for the deployment of technical assistance and grants to improve economic feasibility. To that point, the plan can begin by ending their practice of denying grants to disadvantaged systems that serve more than 10,000 residents. In our case, after years of waiting, we have been denied grants and we have been offered loans without the time to re recalculate the project cost accounting for inflation as we waited for an answer by the water board and bringing it back to our board for consideration. The state water board needs to adopt a policy and a plan on economic feasibility for new drinking water standards to comply with the court's order beginning with chromium six. We believe that the board should hear about the input received at this workshop and direct the staff to come up with options for adoption of a formal policy on economic feasibility and drinking water standards. And I wanna thank everybody again for this opportunity to comment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Ray. I'm gonna put you on mute. Our next speaker is Andrea Ventura from Clean Water Act. Andrea, if you have a video, um, you can start it now. Here I am. Um, and it's Clean Water Action, uh, which we were the Clean Water Act, but we were founded to help pass it though. So. Um, so good afternoon. I um, hope you're all well during this pandemic. Um, I have to say that many of us were distressed by a letter sent to Governor Newsom by the California Manufacturing and Technology Association and other industrial indus uh, interests requesting that all progress on uh, chromium-6, perchlorate, and other environmental issues be halted. I'm really gratified as our, our members that this board has shown leadership to adapt to the current situation and continue to, to serve the public interest. And based on some of the comments we've just heard, I do want to remind us that that court case came from the Manufacturing Association. It did not, uh, and the tax, um, the Cal uh, Solano County Taxpayers Association, not from uh, disadvantaged communities. So I think we need to put that into a little perspective. Um, however, I respect the comments that have been made. My purpose is to provide some general comments on the white paper um, and hopefully um, set this up for other organizations um, working on these issues, particularly those on the ground in communities that are affected to talk about their, their experience. So we've already talked about the health implications of this. It's beyond cancer and reproductive toxicants. Um, we're talking about some serious health effects of this chemical. We don't need to review that. 
But I do think we need to review the fact that by California law, we were required to protect the public by establishing a health protective standard for this contaminant by 2004. It is now 2020. And I mentioned that because we were frankly um, disappointed. We had anticipated that this white paper would outline the state board's approach to conducting economic feasibility analyses based on its many, many years of experience and of course the court case. Um, and instead it is more of this um, kind of proposal of setting out the issues. And while we support stakeholder input, we are concerned that this will and continues to slow down the MCL process that is so needed uh, to protect the public from COMS-6. Um, that said, we feel that um, there were a couple of things that were missing from the, the white paper. Um, of course, a lot of the discussion uh, centered around the costs, um, with a cost of six thousand, almost six thousand dollars a year for treatment of hexavalent chromium after initial investments in infrastructure. But what the white paper did not really consider, you mentioned it in your comments today, but really didn't go into some of the tools that were not available in 2014 that need to be integral in how we decide to move forward on this. First of all, there have been new treatment um, technologies that have been developed that are less expensive. For instance, Coachella Valley Water District piloted the use of stannous chloride, um, turning Chrome 6 into Chrome 3. And it looks to avoid now investing $250 million in ion exchange because this is likely to meet any MCL that we are able to um, establish. We understand that's not a panacea, may not work for everyone, but um, it certainly is a significant breakthrough that has got to play into the cost analysis here to communities. Um, also, there is not really a robust discussion of what um, what the new tools for financing and, and helping disadvantaged communities meet these standards. You know, we don't accept a clean water action that the cost should prohibit protecting public health. Consequently, we and several other organizations that are gonna be speaking today worked very hard over the last decade to pass funding programs that a suite of new governance and financing options that would help these communities. One, of course, is the uh, newly adopted Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund uh, that was established exactly to significantly reduce costs for small systems serving disadvantaged communities. Um, also, um, new um, authorities for the state board for expanding consolidation to bring down costs. And we didn't really see that in the white paper. And why that is concerning to us is because we believe the progress made in treatment and financing should ultimately lead us to an MCL for Chrome 6 that is more health protective than the 10 parts per billion that we saw in 2014. And we have worked to try to make that more affordable and viable for those communities. Um, so I think we have the ability now to correct a mistake we made in 2014 at setting the MCL as high as it was um, and for those who do support cost benefit analysis, I would say that we have to look, you know, we cannot do that until we can say, what is the health cost? What is the cost for people who have cancer and cannot provide for their families? What does that do to their property values and businesses in those communities? The loss of um, time and productivity. Until you can figure out how to include that in a cost benefit analysis, you can't do that in a straightforward way. Um, so I will end my comments here by just calling for two things. One is for those water systems that did not continue to address their Chrome 6 problems, there was a system for this one contaminant that allowed them more time and ability to, to raise the funds, to look at their options and to try to figure out how to comply. For those that stopped, um, doing that when the MCL was vacated, I would strongly urge you to act proactively in anticipation of a new standard and start making the investments or the decisions to protect your consumers. And we do Andrea, call- Andrea, we need you to wrap up. Okay, we do also call for the state board to move forward with this MCL process. I was gratified to hear that you're looking at spring of 2021. 20, uh, we have seen delays for 
over a decade on this. So we'd like to see at least a proposal out by the end of 2020 so that we can, in fact, um, finish the actual standard in 2021 and start protecting our community. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrea. So next we have Debbie Ores from the Community Water Center. Debbie, I'm going to unmute your microphone and ask you to start video if you prefer. Um, you know, we are, did I just get unmuted right there? Can you all hear me? Um, okay, so um, so my name is Debbie Ors with the Community Water Center. I want to first start by echoing the comments made by my colleague, Andrea Ventura. We're disappointed by the snail's pace that the process to develop a new MCL um, has moved, and it's unclear why the MCL package has been further delayed to spring of 2021, which will set the um, MCL package being released nearly four years after the court invalidated the MCL. When the MCL was struck down um, by the courts, all that was called into question was the lack of an economic feasibility analysis. While we appreciate the board wants to do the MCL justice and ensure that they have, they ensure they develop a legally defensible MCL, much like the board successfully did for 123 TCP, um, much of the work of four new MCL has already been completed by DPH when they first set the MCL. Again, it has been three years since the MCL was invalidated. Three more years where Californians across the state have been forced to consume water with a harmful carcinogen in it or purchase costly bottled water with no end in sight. To further note, the costs associated with bottled water are not eligible for state assistance either due to the, uh, either due to the fact that we do not have an MCL. We have teachers from the Central Coast region who will be talking um, later during this workshop who can talk further about the fact that there's the students that they teach um, are being forced to drink this uh, harmful carcinogen in their water and they're unable to fund bottled water for their students. We cannot allow the process for an economic feasibility white paper not even an analysis, just a white paper to further delay the establishment of a new MCL. Um, quickly on economic feasibility itself, um, the world of treatment and dealing with affordability has changed significantly since we since the MCL was first adopted. As mentioned earlier, we now have the Affordable Drinking Water Fund, which is the first time we've had money to be used towards operation and maintenance costs um, associated with treatment systems. Further, the State Water Board has a number of new authorities that can result in lower per customer costs, including consolidations and the appointment of administrators. In closing, residents throughout the state, and in particular residents living within disadvantaged communities, have waited far too long for safe drinking water. And we're asking that this MCL package move forward before the end of 2020 so that we have an MCL in place before the end of 2021. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. We're now gonna hear from Adam uh, Quinones from the Association of California Water Agencies. Adam, I've just unmuted you and you can start your video if you prefer. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Adam Quinones. I'm the State Legislative Director for the Association of California Water Agencies. Just wanna thank the um, staff um, for their effort in this workshop and the opportunity to comment today. Aqua represents um, over 450 public water agencies, and this is an issue that is deeply important to, to many of our members. Um, and, and as you've heard uh, from some of our members already today, um, they're doing extensive work on determining, you know, um, economic feasibility and different metrics and how we consider that. And we certainly know that this is a sort of the first step in a process and that for each um, new MCL, the board is gonna be looking at economic feasibility, um, but we wanna make sure that we get this right the first time um, and, and, and lay a good foundation for, for MCLs going forward. 
Um, so to that end, my questions or, or comments are really more related to process. And I wanna echo what has, what has already been said by the city of Watsonville and, and 29 Palms. Um, and just really encourage um, that the white paper be uh, potentially amended or, or edited to, to reflect some of the comments we heard today. Um, but more importantly, I think we would really encourage that the board members um, discuss this, this white paper in a, in a public format um, and, and potentially take, take action. Um, this is something that is, is really you know, important and is gonna have an impact um, long lasting going forward. And so we just wanna make sure that the, the process is very transparent understand that it's a very difficult time for public hearings right now and, and really appreciate the work that staff have done, um, but would just encourage that, that there be additional discussion from the uh, actual board members. Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Adam. Next, we're gonna be hearing from Trudy Hughes from the California League of Food Producers. Trudy, you are now unmuted. Trudy, uh, if you'd like to speak, make sure that you accept the unmute on your phone. It seems there may be some technical difficulties going on with Trudy, so we'll come back to her. Uh, Stacy Taylor from Mesa Water District. Um, if you'd like to speak, I will unmute you now. All right, uh, we're having trouble finding Stacy Taylor. Uh, they may have left the meeting. Uh, next, the floor will go to Andrea Galdamez from Self Help Enterprises. Andrea, you are now unmuted. Andrea, uh, make sure that you are unmuting yourself. Uh, accepting the unmute request to your computer. There we are. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to comment on the white paper discussion on economic feasibility analysis in consideration of the HEX Chrome MCL. Um, I work as a community development specialist with self-help enterprises. And first, I'd like to give my support to the city of Watsonville and 29 Palms. Um, I really heard you guys out and agreed so much with what you said about the grant process um, for um, disadvantaged communities. So thank you for your comments. Um, I work with communities to secure clean drinking water through state funds. I'm currently working with a community of Tuleville in Exeter, California. They have a hex, they have hex chrome in their water that exceeds the um, MCL of 10 um, parts per billion. Um, my question, I mainly had questions about um, the white paper as I was reading it. Um, so here are my questions. One, why are we taking this, why take this intermediary step of developing a document describing the approach to an economic feasibility rather than um, actually undertaking the economic feasibility question? Um, and you've already given a timeline to develop the economic feasibility analysis. So thank you for that. And I'm happy uh, that we can see um, uh, something by spring 2021. <clears throat> and my third question, has uh, Cal OEHA been asked to provide more information about the calculation of the public health goal and the related health costs in dollar terms? Uh, fourth question, and is there not a risk to the MCL's economic visibility being challenged for adequacy for not having included um, small systems under 200, 200 connections? And um, can the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund um, safer be part of the calculation as a subsidy for the aff affordability component for smaller systems? Uh, thank you for your, the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you.
you don't have to. Um, next, we have Marina West from the Bighorn Desert View Water Agency. Marina, you are now unmuted. Uh, Marina, if you're trying to speak right now, we can't hear you. It seems Marina may be having some technical difficulties, so we're going to go to the next speaker. Next, we'll hear from Mark Mueller from Myoma Dunes Water Company. Um, next, we'll hear from Mark Iverson from the Western Heights Water Company. There seems to be some issues with, with people's mics here. Um, next, we're going to be going to Gabrielle Dima Smith from Cal Mutuals. Um, just and checking. When you're ready, can Gabrielle, you can, you can start. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, good afternoon, board members, staff, and members of the community in attendance. Um, my name is Gabriel Dima Smith. I serve as the legislative director for the California Association of Mutual Water Companies. Cal Mutual represents many small systems serving disadvantaged communities in the state, and our members deeply care about the process of setting new MCLs. While we agree that determining economic feasibility requires a multifaceted approach, it should not mean that theory should win over the real lack of affordability on the ground. For example, the white paper asserts that economic feasibility should not mean jeopardizing the health of 95% of people that are served by larger water systems, and we agree, but also assert that it doesn't have to. In the quest for economic feasibility, the state can allow phased implementation and enforcement provisions that allow larger systems to go first, creating economies of scale that lowers technological costs and allows time to strategically plan grants and technical assistance to wrap up with smaller water systems needing to comply. Finally, we support the formal adoption of a policy by the state water board and a plan for helping small water systems comply as part of the MCL setting process. Thank you for allowing me to speak today and I applaud the efforts of the staff to make this happen. We look forward to submitting our written comments and working with the board on this matter. Thank you for your comment, Gabriel. Next, we'll be hearing from Linda Noriega from California Domestic Water Company. Hi, um, can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Linda Noriega and I'm the president of California Domestic Water Company and also a member of the California Association of Mutual Water Companies. We're one of the founding members of Cal Mutuals and so um, assisting and providing assistance where we can to smaller systems is at the heart and the core of what that association was formed to do. The agency I represent, California Domestic Water Company, 
serves approximately 180,000 residents in the cities of Whittier, La Mirada, La Habra, and Brea. In the white paper, it asserts that there's a range of strategies and funding sources available to achieve compliance and to offset costs of new regulations, including grants, low or no interest loans, point of use or point of entry treatment, variances, exemptions, and consolidations, just to name a few. However, the response, the, the strategies and the funding sources proposed leave small water systems without many answers. We cannot leave behind the poorest among us. Many small water systems do not have the resources to hire experts to navigate the grant application process. Alternatives to grants for financial support to small systems that do not require engagement of expensive consultants and are easy to accent, a access are urgently needed. The State Water Board's Office of Financial Assistance is not transparent about grant qualifications and priorities causing many water systems that attempt to apply stranded with regulation letter, rejection letters and having spent thousands for consultants needed in the application process, which then furthers, further prevents them from investing that money in other investments for their system and their operations. Further, Small systems generally do not have the resources to implement studies to evaluate alternative treatment options. The State Water Board cannot simply point to alternative compliance mechanisms to establish that a proposed MCL is economically feasible for affected systems without first determining if those options are actually viable for those systems. I thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you for your comment, Linda. Next, we'll be hearing from Lars Johnson from the Royal Oaks Mutual Water Company. Lars, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. It won't let me, ah, now it unmuted me. Okay, good. My name is Lars Jorgensen. I'm president of Royal Oaks Mutual Water Company. We're a small 30 connection uh, rural company uh, that uh, everybody serves volunteer and the only profit is used to save up for maintenance. Our current budget is about 24,000 a year. If we had your cost estimate of $5,600 per year, you're talking about adding $168,000 to the budget. It won't happen. People will drop out. People will give up on getting water. When you consider the economic feasibility and the benefits of this regulation, you must also consider the people that you're going to eliminate having water and the harms that you're doing. It doesn't matter if it's affordable on average in the state. It's completely unaffordable for small systems. Possibilities include having like point of use, but the county won't allow that if the state doesn't specifically say so. So if you're gonna consider this, then please don't just shuffle and say, well, you might do this, you might do that. You have to say what you will tolerate, what will be okay. In the end, if this goes through and we have to put something in for the whole system, the water company will simply fold. That has disastrous effects on, on people's homes. If you have a home that has no water, you can't hardly sell it. So please think very carefully when you think about economic feasibility and don't wave a wand that says, well, it works on average because it doesn't work for many, many people. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Next, we'll be hearing from Richard Morrison from the Wildwood East Mutual Water Company. I can't figure out how to, okay. It's, uh, let me, I, I lost it on my computer. I'm gonna try and get it back up. Okay, is it better? No, I'm sorry. We're getting some really dramatic feedback. Make sure that you, you only have... Me. 
I think you, you, you're, I can't mute myself. You need to mute me. Okay, I'm, okay, I okay, should be good. All right, are we there? Um, Richard, make sure that you only have the Zoom app open and just one device with audio. My apologies. I'm sorry, we're still getting really dramatic feedback. Um, make sure that you have no other devices that are emitting the Zoom call at the moment. And maybe turn your volume down if you're on speakerphone. All right, is that better? That's better, thank you. All right, great, I apologize for that. Um, this is Richard Morrison, Rick Morrison from Wildwood East Mutual Water Company in Yuba City, California, about an hour north of Sacramento. We are a community system of all volunteers. We were established in 85 and around 2011, um, the water systems, small water systems around us all had arsenic problems, became non-compliant along with an elementary school next to us. We did not become uncompliant and they all received a grant to connect to the Yuba City water system. We later became non-compliant on arsenic after that grant was closed, so we weren't part of it. When um, the hexavalent chromium issue started back in 14, um, our water company was running 12 to 14 parts per billion, so we were out of sync with the uh, hexavalent chromium. Uh, obviously, all the small water companies around us that were connected to the Yuba City system didn't have that problem. We went ahead and hired Waterworks Engineers, a professional operation for the sum of $17,000 to come up with alternatives for us to attempt to comply with the new MCL. And we um, settled on one that gave us an opportunity to achieve uh, the MCL by connecting to the Yuba City water system for just our drinking water. They would not provide any more water that would include anything outside of the home, but they would include the drinking water. Um, to date, we have spent $52,000 investigating the possibility of doing this with legal with hiring waterworks engineers and spending uh, over $23,000 with the Yuba City, city of Yuba City to become part of that city in preparation to connect. In July of 2016, waterworks engineers estimated a cost of $2.6 million for our 48 connections which would be over $54,000 per connection. I'm sure that sum has gone up more than that by now in the last four years. Um, our concern is we felt the state set a precedent back in 2012 by providing uh, the grant to all the water systems around us where all each home had to pay was for their water meter and connection of about $1,400. We would like to see something similar to that. We do not have any other alternatives that uh, of the five alternatives that were identified, uh, none of them will fit us relative to this professional group that we've hired to give us the analyzation of it. So uh, our, Rick, please try and wrap it up. Our sense of things is that we need to look at some kind of a grant basis to help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next, we're going to be hearing from uh, Mark Grajeda from Pico Water District. Mark, I have just unmuted you. Um, good afternoon, board members and staff. My name is Mark Rajeda. I serve as the general manager for Pico Water District, which serves a population of 25,000 in the city of Pico Rivera, located in Los Angeles County. 
Our system serves a community which has uh, areas of disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged neighborhoods. We are supportive of the state's efforts to address public health concerns regarding chromium-6, but are puzzled as to why the white paper has disregarded the court's opinion related to how cost estimates for treatment are developed. Our system is not directly impacted by chromium-6, but we are following the process very closely due to our concerns about how this process will impact the MCL process for PFOS chemicals, which we are directly impacted by. The last standard for chromium-6 was invalidated by the court because of its failure to consider whether cost estimates were economically feasible. We fear that if these mistakes are not addressed now, they will be made again when setting the MCL for PFOS. The white paper proposes a multifaceted approach that doesn't contain a clear methodology of how a conclusion will be drawn from the multifaceted approach, which, clear, which clearly ignores the court's opinion. With the standard for chromium-6 long delayed, it is alarming that the, white, uh, the water board would allow development of a methodology in clear opposition of, uh, to the court's uh, opinion, which invalidated a previous standard without a formal review of the feedback provided in this workshop. White papers disregard the court's opinion for setting a new standard for chromium-6 or any other pollutant will exasperate uncertainty and set a precedent of high costs for small water suppliers impacted by contaminants of emergent concern. We ask that the Water Board develop a framework for their system of feasibility evaluation supported by scientific research that will allow stakeholders to understand how the Board will approach the implementation of economic feasibility for chromium-6 and how this process will relate to other contaminants of emergent concern like PFOS. I thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next, we'll be hearing from Nick Massetti from the Redwood Lodge Water Company. Nick, I've sent you a request to unmute your mic. Um, Nick, if you can please accept the request to unmute your mic. I did. There we go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, my name is Nick Massetti. I represent the uh, Redwood Lodge Water Company in Santa Cruz County. Uh, we service only 14 connections. We're a state small. Uh, we're regulated by the PUC. Um, I'm a engineer with 45 years experience in the Silicon Valley area, and I tend to want to test uh, the assumptions under these dis discussions. And I want to bring to the <clears throat> attention of the workshop, the recent publication by Ms. Nina Su in the uh, journal Critical Reviews in Toxicology, in which she conducted a systematic review of 47 human and animal studies related to the relationship between hex chromium and stomach cancer. Her results discredited the two animal studies that underpin the current public health goal for hex chromium and definitively concludes that chrome six does not pose a stomach cancer hazard in human. This should support that the current MCL that we use now for our title 21 tests are sufficient. I think it's important to use current science as our basis. Now, only if people inhale the water into their lungs would they be at risk of cancer. So if we can just keep our president away from recommending something like that, I think we'll be just fine. Thank you for the ability to comment. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll be hearing from Jay Kettleson from the Monterey Bay Academy Water System. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. 
Okay, uh, we're a small self-supporting school, uh, about four and a half miles from Watsonville, about three miles from Soquel Water District. Um, connecting to those systems is obviously financially um, not a feasible project for us. Um, Jackie from Watsonville succinctly basically stated all the points that we feel are pertinent in our situation. Um, while we're supportive of the state's efforts to provide quality drinking water, and we believe that we do, um, we also reflect the science comments from the gentleman that we just heard from from Redwood that um, is really a concern if you're not breathing it. In our case, with our small school, point of use filtration would work. We control our entire system, our campus, faculty housing, we could monitor uh, with whatever frequencies were required. We could install, we can service. And if the state would clearly allow for systems such as ours, we have less than 80 connections, point of use filtration, it would be very doable. In 2015, when we were first trying to meet the NCL requirements of having all the studies and everything done, Within the, the first year, within 2015-2016, we spent over $100,000 on analysis systems, planning, etc. And our, our water budget for our entire system for our school is less than $25,000 a year. So if we were to use the, the state's numbers in the white paper, about $5,600 per connection, we'd be looking at uh, $400,000 plus per year. That's, that's just not practical. Systems like us, we strongly urge the state to look at allowing managed point of use at facilities like ours. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Next, we'll be hearing from David Harrison from the Southern California Water Coalition. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Harrison. I am the co-chair of the Water Quality Task Force for the Southern California Water Coalition. A Southern California Water Coalition is comprised of water suppliers, elected officials, and businesses in the region stretching from Kern County to Imperial County, representing over half of California's population. While the board is seeking input specific to the development of an MCL for Chromium 6, the Southern California Water Coalition understands and recommends that the ideas and methodologies arising from this rulemaking may, may be applied in the development of future drinking water standards. Our comments, therefore, are made in light of this understanding. As alluded to in the board's white paper, economic feasibility is a complex, multifaceted issue that requires consideration of a range of analytic tools and associated metrics. We agree with the point that the board raises in its white paper that no single method or metric is sufficient. However, a haphazard approach that may vary appreciably across potential rulemakings is not a sound methodology for establishing prudent standards to protect public health. Rather, we believe that the state board needs to develop a systematic and consistent framework using multiple methods and metrics for evaluating the economic feasibility of future potential drinking water standards. The framework should account for potential differences in data availability and identify key decision points, including when further analysis is warranted. This approach should be structured around the following two sequenced questions. One, do the proposed MCLs or other standards or policies provide benefits that justify the costs? If benefits are deemed to exceed or otherwise justify costs, then two, is the MCL affordable? We agree with panelists' comments that this workshop should not be a dead end, but that the board should review the input and then determine a formal policy and plan for addressing economic feasibility when adopting drinking water quality standards. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, David. Next, we're going to be hearing from Paul Portney from the American Chemistry Council. Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I'm calling from Santa Barbara, where I live. I'm a consultant, retired from full-time work. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm 
have prepared comments at the request of the American Chemistry Council. Uh, I have a PhD in economics from Northwestern. I spent 33 years at Resources for the Future in Washington, DC, an independent nonpartisan think tank specializing in the application of economics to environmental issues. I've had visiting teaching positions at the public policy schools of both UC Berkeley and Princeton. And I finished my full-time working career as professor of economics and dean of the business school at the University of Arizona. In 1979 and 1980, I had the privilege to act as the chief economist at the White House Council on Environmental Quality under President Jimmy Carter. Uh, turning to my comments, I think that the white paper struggles throughout to define clearly what economic feasibility means, and it seems to continually come back to the notion that it has something to do with affordability. But under section 116365 of the California Health and Safety Code, affordability and economic feasibility are mentioned separately. Uh, and the clear implication is that they aren't intended to mean the same thing. It seems to me that economic feasibility should in, be interpreted uh, to mean striking some kind of balance between the health protection associated with drinking water standards and the costs that households would have to bear to meet those standards. In fact, in 2008, the Department of Water Resources within the California State Resources Agency said, quote, the test of economic feasibility is passed if the total benefits that result from a project exceed those that would accrue without the project by an amount in excess of costs. So economic feasibility clearly should strike some kind of balance between the good that a regulation would do and the costs that it would impose. Second, the white paper talks at great length about the difficulty of assigning dollar values to health benefits, and yet there's a long history of doing this quite routinely. Guidance on how to do so has been issued by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under both Republican and Democratic presidents, by the Office of Management and Budget, the Food and Drug Administration, the U.K.'s National Health Service, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and other organizations. So there's clearly a literature on how to place dollar values on human health effects. Paul, Third, please wrap it up. Big pardon? Um, you're over time. Oh, Do you wanna okay. just uh, finish up quickly? I will. Uh, even if there's an aversion to assigning dollar values, the various health benefits of drinking water standards can be compared using life year saved or even quality adjusted life year saved. And this is done routinely. And finally, what I would recommend is a two part process in standard setting. First, the agency assures itself that the health protection is sufficient to more than offset the costs, thus meeting the economic feasibility criteria and then deal with situations where one or more communities would struggle with the costs of meeting the standard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Next, we'll be hearing from Michael Claiborne from the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Claiborne. I'm an attorney with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, um, and I also represent Tuleyville Mutual Nonprofit Water Company. Tuleyville Mutual is a water company that serves 76 households in Tulare County. Its water has consistently exceeded the prior MCL for Chrome 6. We have tests as recently as December showing uh, results of 12 parts per billion. The residents of Tuleyville and other similarly situated water systems have a human right to safe drinking water. This right applies regardless of whether a community is small or large, whether it is rural or urban, whether the water system serves a community of color. So let's consider economic feasibility in the context of small disadvantaged communities of color like Tuleyville. Every resident we have talked to supports an MCL that is as protective of public health as possible. As recognized by the white paper, small disadvantaged communities like Tuleyville would struggle to afford just about any treatment uh, absent support from the state. 
That would be true of treatment for nitrate, for 1,2,3-TCP, for arsenic, and yes, it would be true of hexavalent chromium. The answer is not to fail to protect public health because it can be expensive. The white paper discusses some appropriate approaches. In particular, the State Water Board must consider economic feasibility in the context of available policy solutions and funding sources, including SB 200, the Drinking Water SRF, water bonds, and consolidation authority under SB 88 and the subsequent legislation. SB 88 consolidation would pro provide a clear solution in Tuleyville after a new standard for Chrome 6 is set, as the new nearby city of Exeter could supply safe and affordable drinking water to residents. We urge the state board to move forward with setting a new MCL for Chrome 6 as quickly as possible and that the MCL be set at a level that protects public health for all Californians. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Next, we'll be hearing from Wade Cohen from the City of Winters. Am I on? Whenever you're ready, Wade. Okay. All right, good afternoon board members. My name is Wade Cowan and I'm the mayor for the city of Winters. The physical impact of the proposed new MCL will have a devastating financial impact on our community. The costs associated with the needed processing system will impact operational costs, absorb all the city's financing capabilities and cause impacts to our businesses and residents, which are significant. Some basics on our system is we have approximately 2,200 customers of which 90% are residential and 10% business industrial. In our customer base, almost 30% are either low income or seniors. Our MCL number on hexavalent chromium is 17 parts per billion. This is almost six times lower than the current federal level and three times lower than the current state level. Back in 2014-15, when you were proposing the 10 parts per billion, um, we spent over $200,000 for engineering evaluation on how to reach those numbers. And those costs came back at 27 million to $47 million. Currently, it's anticipated that the typical residential unit in our city will see their base water bill increase from the current rate of $45.51 to between 138.74 to 195.97 per month. That's an increase of 305% to 431% for Chromium 6 compliance alone. A $40 million project will literally absorb the city's financing capacity for capital infrastructure projects. We're not sure who would be willing to finance such a project, especially since it is non-reimbursable and does not provide a single drop of new water into the system. Operationally, we will see our cost increase from 3 million to 5 million, 60% increase in recurring costs. Ultimately, the city and system will be challenged with new rates and operational financing costs. Choices will be needed to allocate costs into rates and without question, you will see decisions made which will sacrifice proactive maintenance and improvements to the entire system because of this one system, literally stealing from Peter to pay Paul. The economics of this decision is critical for a community like Winners because you are determining our capital infrastructure future in a single MCL. The staff and you as a board need to understand that public health can be reallocated by forcing improvements in one side of the system at the detriment of the others. Forcing an unenforceable water rate on consumers also needs to be considered. Seniors and lower income consumers will be forced to choose between water, food, and medicine. In many cases, this decision, increasing someone's water rate by $150 a month, may make it unaffordable for some people to live independently. Their quality of life will shrink. From a water standards pr perspective, the idea that California will have an Wade, MCL of Wade. nine times, yes. Um, yes you're I'll over time. Okay, the process should be based on the specific comments of others in the water community about what such a true process would look like. The white paper identifies the problem but does not provide a meaningful process to address the economic feasibility question. The board should have a meaningful process in place before it starts with the MCL. Thank you. 
Thank you, Wade. Next, we're going to be hearing from Chris Webb from Renaissance High School. Hi. Um, so one thing I've been hearing, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. One thing I've been uh, hearing with this about the feasibility is that I'm wondering if the board and um, participants are considering that if a family member gets cancer, that that could substantially that they might not be that might not be feasible for their economic situation, and if they succumb, that's going to hurt the bottom line of the uh, the water company. That's one less customer. I I I really feel that at our school we we need this MCL. We need some sort of MCL. Um, the lack of one when when the old MCL was instituted, we got um, bottled water service, the the cooler jugs. When the MCL was invalidated, we had to nego negotiate to get uh, funding from the district for that. It was going to come out of our site funding. We were going to lose resources to provide a basic uh, necessity water to students because of uh, the lack of an MCL. Now with that lack of MCLs, we also um, are having some, we're at a roadblock with the district in that um, they're, they're basically saying, hey, we're following the current law, which is inadequate. And um, so based on that, you, we don't need to have better testing that distinguishes between Chrome 6 and Chrome 3. So we're in a situation now where it's very hard to even um, monitor the safety. And, um, and the result is we have a, a, a big liability to the students and to the teachers. I'm, I'm concerned too, because even with the bottle service, we're still using um, we're still like washing our hands and, and uh, you know, cooking with the, the faucet water, which is contaminated. And I wonder like, what about the long-term effects of that? On the feasibility thing as well, I'm thinking that if there are uh, industrial practices that increase chromium-6 concentrations, such as um, groundwater pumping, if that's a factor, then, then perhaps we should institute a, some sort of uh, tax on you know excessive groundwater pumping, and then use that money to fund grants to subsidize smaller water systems. Um, so I, I just want to urge the institution of MCL. I'm not necessarily saying 10 parts per billion; that may be um, too strict of a standard, but some sort of MCL that that factors in again public health, um, and and then we can protect our students, protect teachers who have long-term exposure year after year. Um, this is going into about like the third year, third school year, where this scenario is up in the air. And I'd like to see some resolution, at least like on the road by the end of 2020. I don't want to go into the 2021, 22 school year still unresolved. Thank you for your, your time. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have California, Nevada section of AWWA. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to participate in this workshop today. I have identified my affiliation with the California, Nevada section of AWWA. But at this time, my comments are still mine alone and our organization does expect to submit comments that represent our 100 year history of commitment to safe drinking water and a good regulatory process based on sound science and economic considerations. I know I can speak for my organization that we do applaud the water board's efforts to grapple with this important issue. And I offer these comments in the same spirit of openly searching for a workable policy solution. And I just want to point out a few questions and additional observations. First, and this point has been made by other speakers, uh, the main conclusion of the paper is that this, the Water Board must take a multifaceted approach to looking at economic feasibility, considering multiple lines of evidence. My questions are, with the degree of subjectivity left to the Water Board from this white paper, what would prevent every new MCL being challenged as arbitrary or subjective or lacking consistency? 
uh, the water board may be concerned that there is not a standard framework that would be legally defensible. The main point I want to, uh, set of points I want to uh, bring up is that the white paper tries to separate economic feasibility from questions of affordability at the individual household level. But in doing so, the paper possibly minimizes some rather relevant uh, issues. So on page 10, for instance, it says suggestions have been made that economic feasibility not only look at treatment costs, but also at how those additional costs are added to already strained budgets. This seems like a very important point. First, depending on the treatment or other compliance strategy, drinking water regulations can produce treatment costs that are additive as well as mutual or shared. Second, this recognizes that for every cost associated with the drinking water regulation, there is also an opportunity cost, and this pushes the decision down into the realm of household affordability. For consumers, and especially those that are economically disadvantaged, to pay higher rates for new drinking water costs, that may foreclose their opportunity to pay for other health-related costs, even for a more acute health need. If the regulatory analysis looks at possible benefits from reduced healthcare costs as suggested in the white paper, it may be just as important to look at health-related expenses that may be precluded by higher water rates. In fact, household affordability may be a factor or component in determining economic feasibility, and the white paper seems to want to put this completely on the water system's water rate-making decision, water rate decision-making without also acknowledging the state's share of responsibility. The paper acknowledges that determining economic feasibility may need to include a consideration of redistributed methods such as, quote, grants, redesigned rate structures, or bill payment assistance programs to make a regulation more affordable at the water system level. This indirectly- Tim, Tim you're uh, over time. Do you want to please wrap it up? Thank you. Just a, another moment. This gives a nod to the economic realities of unequal distribution of wealth. Um, since water treatment, or in many cases, replacement water from a new source would be ongoing cost of operation, it seems important for the state to define upfront if there is a continuous perpetual source of subsidy for operation of a system that cannot, through its water rates, afford those increased costs. I And I raise this question in consideration of the five-year lifespan of the funds appropriated from the for the very laudable safer program. Thank you very much for this opportunity to hear from stakeholders. Thank you, Tim. Next, we'll be hearing from Steve Bigley from the Coachelli Valley Water District. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you. Last year, Section 64418A, Title 22 of the California Code of Regulations was updated to include a process using variable metrics for determining immediate economic feasibility for installing water treatment to meet MCLs where lower and higher median household income occur. Instead of concluding that no formula exists, the white paper should acknowledge Section 6441A the provisions in it and expand on the process with specific tools and metrics needed to complete the economic feasibility analysis for all impacted water systems. The white paper critiques the cost benefit analysis and it's not clear whether the state's white paper approach will even include this analysis. This analysis should not be abandoned and we have two suggestions for improving it. First, to better estimate the benefits, start by coordinating the MCL rulemaking process with the Chromium 6 risk assessment update initiated by OHIA in 2016. An updated risk assessment is needed before the incremental benefits of proposed MCLs can be determined based on the best available information. Second, it is essential that the compliance period provided for water systems to meet the MCL be considered when developing cost estimates. Allowing six months or less to comply with a new MCL drive costs up as water systems take action to reduce their liability associated with compliance deadlines that can't be met. 
For example, a water system temporarily shutting down wells to satisfy an MCL deadline just puts the community at greater risk when something unexpected causes water demands to exceed supply. Appropriate compliance periods similar to those required in the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act promotes innovation, reduces compliance costs, and makes new MCLs more economically feasible. We expected the white paper would provide the roadmap for a process that we could build on rather than what is effectively a blank slate. We will need more time than May 15th to provide the level of input needed to fill in the blank. Finally, the document that ultimately details this process for new MCLs should be presented to and considered by the State Water Resources Control Board members. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Next, we have David Schultes from the Golden State Water Company. And David, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Uh, please accept the request. It seems your video is working, uh, but you're still on mute. Sorry, I'm not sure how I got on this list, but I didn't have a uh, comment. We can hear you. I didn't have a comment. I'm not sure how I got on this list. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Melissa Dennis from uh, representing herself. And Melissa, I've just unmuted you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm a teacher at Ohlone Elementary School in Watsonville. My school water supply has elevated levels of chromium six far above the previous MCL. We have under 500 students but we have four students with cancer in the last five years. Teachers like myself and parents concerned, um, are concerned that we have so many kids with cancer while simultaneously drinking water that is, has a carcinogen in it, like chromium-6. When teachers asked the school district for help, we were told that we weren't breaking the law because there was no MCL. Also, we qualified for free water delivery service through the state water board grants, but our district refused to apply because they said we weren't breaking the law. Without a strong MCL, people like us are powerless. That's why we need a health protected MCL as soon as possible. The public has no way to protect their communities without one. With every additional case of cancer, there's a huge cost to families, their communities, and to school districts. I have seen these costs firsthand, and that's why if we truly care about low-income communities, we will protect their water. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Melissa. And with that, we're going to take a short break. Um, we'll be back at 3.20. And if you are still wanting to make a suggestion or, uh, sorry, a comment, and you're in the Zoom room, just ensure that you have a number next to your name with your full name and your organization. If you don't see that, make sure that you send us an email with your name and organization and username so that we can identify you. Uh, additionally, we have a phone number that is unidentified, area code 760, last three digits 967. Uh, if that's you and you would like to make a comment, please send us an email so that we can identify you. And again, the email is ddwregunit at waterboards.ca.gov. We'll be back soon.
Hello, everyone. We're back from break. I'm going to go back to two of the speakers that we called on earlier, but were unable to hear from. Hopefully, we can work out the technical difficulties this time. Uh, Marina West from the Bighorn Desert View Water Agency. I'm unmuting you right now. Marina West, it says that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. All right, so Marina may be having some technical difficulties there. Next, we're going to go back to another speaker, that um, Trudy Hughes. Trudy, I'm unmuting you right now. You may need to accept the unmute request. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trudy Hughes. I'm with the California League of Food Producers, representing food processing industry in California. Uh, thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity to provide some feedback on the white paper. Uh, food processors offer a pretty unique voice in this discussion today as we're an unlikely regulated entity under the drinking water standards. Uh, many of my members uh, have private wells and are uh, basically own and operate their own water systems. They're basically considered non-transient, non-community water systems, making them subject to the drinking water standards. So our members take uh, compliance with these drinking water standards extremely seriously because their systems are not only serve their employees, but they also are used to wash food products, to clean the plants, and it's used uh, in the food products themselves. Thus, the FDA does require that food processors meet all drinking water standards uh, in California. So compliance with the Chrome 6 MCL uh, is, is extremely expensive uh, for my members. And uh, it's mostly our, our members uh, are up here in Northern California with naturally incurring chrome sticks in, in some of their drinking water wells. Uh, it could cost into the, into the millions of dollars for some of these folks, which is catastrophically high for, for an industry with such low margins. These are folks that are, are making tomato paste and canning tomatoes and things like that. So it's a very low margin uh, uh, industry. And we would absolutely agree that California faces real drinking water problems that deserve immediate attention. But, but we believe it's critical that any new drinking water regulation produce public health benefits uh, that are worth the added cost of compliance. But in other words, not just how much it would cost to achieve a given MCL, but how much more health protection would result from that investment. So very important from my members' perspective is that cost estimates should not be limited to just public water systems, which should also include the non-transient, non-community water systems too. Um, and it's, it's really important that we believe, uh, further believe that the analysis supporting the proposed MCL should consider alternative standards, which would impact future access to water supplies. It seems like there seems to be an assumption that small water systems can simply tap into grant funds, file a variance or, or use uh, uh, point of use treatments. But the reality is the, the board has never evaluated these alternative compliance mechanisms to determine if they would actually work. Um, and finally, I think with regard to the white paper in particular, uh, we share some of the concerns with regard to standardization and transparency. Using different lines of evidence on a case-by-case -case basis makes it a moving target for stakeholders to navigate the process. Uh, and we would, we would ask you to look to the statutory precedent for a more transparent approach, which is found through SB 617 through uh, 2011, uh, which created the Supplemental Re uh, Regulatory Impact Assessment, SRIA, which has been used to great avail in other uh, agencies such as Cal OSHA. Um, so th the water board shouldn't be recreating the wheel. Let's, let's look at existing protocol that is already proven effective. And finally, I know I'm out of time. Uh, we ask that the board clarify how it will incorporate public comments into a revised draft guidance document that the staff present that revised document to the board um, at a future public meeting for its consideration. Um, appreciate your uh, circling back with me and appreciate the opportunity to comment today and we'll provide a uh, written comment. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. I just want to remind everyone that if you want to make a public comment, uh, it's absolutely critical that we have you identified in the Zoom room. So again, there's a couple people in here, seven, area code 760 ending in 967. We have not identified you. Um, there's also some people in the, uh, in the Zoom room that have names that we 
cannot identify. Um, if you want to speak, you still have time to send us an email at ddwregunit at waterboards.ca.gov. Uh, make sure you do that if you would like to speak. Next, we'll be hearing from Krishna Feldman from the Olone Elementary School. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have accepted video, but I do not see myself, so I do not know if I'm on. Um, I am speaking personally, not really representing Ohlone Elementary School, but um, my, uh, another staff member did speak on a similar topic that I will. And uh, at Ohlone Elementary School, we became aware uh, last school year that our, at the beginning of the school year, that our levels of chromium-6 were about on average of 13 parts per billion. And we do serve a disadvantaged community. And it saddens me to hear from people like Jackie who say, oh, because I live in Watsonville, and who said we can't afford um, to set, basically she's saying we can't afford to set a decent, a low MCL. Um, I personally put in a reverse osmosis system in my house because I, you know, I'm trying to conceive and, and it's, we have arsenic in our water and chromium six and other things. And it's, it's these very disadvantaged communities that need you to set an MCL and quickly and set one that is, um, pays attention to our public health, the public health goal. And so I do applaud uh, the water, water board for going ahead and having this meeting, even in this time of crisis. Um, we, I'd like to also mention that we did, we, it took us months, but we eventually got um, reverse osmosis systems put in our school. But if you, but our school district was afraid to ask for funding because they didn't want to admit they were out of compliance. So if you can set goals and maybe not make that a requirement for the grants. Um, and I hope that we could uh, have you look at point of use and, and grant funding for those communities, those water districts that have very few uh, uh, attachments like our school at Ohlone Elementary. And I would also like to say that, you know, there is other technology besides reverse osmosis and ion exchange that could cost a lot less. Um, there are ways to reduce uh, chromium-6 to chromium-3, plant-based. Uh, there's other, there's multiple methods. So, and, and the board assuming that the water districts are gonna use the most expensive way to fix the problem is not in my mind viable because I know our water district, what they are gonna do if a MCL is ever put on is that they will likely blend our water with Pajaro, which is nearby that has very low chromium-6. And I'm afraid if you only look at what's the best way to remove it all, you're going to think we need that it's going to cost a lot more than what it actually is. Um, thank you. Please set an MCL soon and send it, set it as low as possible. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you for your comment, Krishna. Next, we'll be hearing from Avinash Kar from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation, the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Avinash Kar. I'm with the Natural Resources Defense Council. I echo the comments of my colleagues at Clean Water Action at Leadership Council and uh, Community Water Center. We urge you to move expeditiously to finalize an MCL for Chromium-6 uh, and to avoid further delays. Action is now 14 years delayed since the original statutory deadline in 2004. NRDC and others were involved in the litigation to compel that first MCL uh, for Chromium-6 in 2014. We recognize that some of the delays that in the result uh, are the result of the CMTA litigation, but it has already been three years since that litigation. And, Still, there has been little movement. Um, in the meantime, communities and vulnerable citizens continue to be exposed to this dangerous carcinogenic chemical in their water. And MCLs is needed to protect them. 
the, the water board already knows what it needs to do for a successful economic impact analysis. As you noted earlier, the recent one, two, three TCP analysis is an example. And this white paper should not further delay action as a result. Uh, we urge you to uh, move ahead and release an MTL package by the end of 2020 and make sure that people have the protections they need uh, for their health. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Avinash. Next, we're gonna be hearing from Emma Poleva from the Jones Environmental Laboratories. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, well, thank you. Thank you very much for um, allowing us to voice our opinions and concerns about the economic feasibility of hexav hexavalent chromium. Um, unfortunately, I think the white paper is heavily sided with the business side. Um, there is a reason why public concern is has been the most prevalent part that we look at. Um, but yeah, does everyone hear how expensive this cleanup is? It's, uh, it's a lot more expensive to clean this up than to prevent the pollution. And a lot of the time the cleanup doesn't even really work. In my, expense, in my extensive experience of, uh, for testing for these contaminants, uh, the concentrations are mind boggling and they're everywhere and they spread. And I don't know, I think prevention is gonna be the best way. But in the meantime, um, yeah, low income is greatly and proportionally affected. They don't have the means to clean this up and they're usually the sites for these pollutions because no one's, no one's got time to really be aware of what's going on. And um, hexavalent chromium especially is beyond nasty. Just to gently say that it's more toxic than chromium-3, which yes, is an essential uh, metal for human life in low concentrations. Um, just to say that it's a little more toxic than that, I think is insulting and ignorant. Um, hexavalent chromium is insanely toxic at low concentrations. Uh, I've worked with a lot less toxic substances and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money to continue this way is really suicide. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed or didn't enjoy, but the Watsonville comment is on point with the small systems that we don't want to count because they're not economically feasible yet. They are the poor areas that will not afford this. And that is where most of the farming happens. That is where our food is coming from. That is why they are polluted the way they are. They're doing it for the greater benefit of the whole state, the whole country almost. Um, Emma, but anyway, um, could, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up. You got it. Um, but yes, the feasibility does need to include the benefit and the cost. It is really, really expensive. I think we do need to just stop at the source. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Blanca Escobeda from the Leadership Council for Justice, Justice and Accountability. Thank you. Uh, my name is Blanca Escobedo with Leadership Council. Um, I'm actually here to um, speak um, about some comments submitted by two Tuleville residents. Um, and I'm just going to uh, speak them in verbatim. The first resident is Benjamin Cuevas. Um, and he says, my name is Benjamin Cuevas. I'm a resident of Tuleville and a member of the Safer Advisory Board. Tuleville has been waiting a long time now for a hex chrome regulation that will protect the health of our community. Our water sample results have shown that hexavalent chromium is present in our water supply over the uh, past legal limit. We received bottled water from the county and the state water board, but we know that that cannot hold us on forever. We ask the board to place a strong regulation on hex chrome so that water systems like Tuleville can take action to protect ourselves and get access to clean water. And the second comment I have from a Tuleville resident, his name is Ruben Salazar. He's also the president of Tuleville Mutual. And he says, we need Chrome 6 to be regulated so that the city of Exeter can see that our water is unsafe. We deserve to drink clean water like anyone else in San Francisco or Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Blanca. 
Next, we're going to be hearing from Becky Steinbrunner from Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, presentation. I am on the telephone. I do not have the video capability, so I would like to ask that the slides, any slides that you presented today, please be put up um, someplace publicly on the uh, State Water Board website. And I agree with the other commenter that I would also like to see the compendium, um, ultimately, of public comment that is submitted to the board so that uh, the public can see all that. I am um, quite appalled as well that this is taking so long when we are looking at, uh, as we've heard, kids getting cancer more and more at schools where the chromium-6 levels are high in the drinking water. And I have um, been knowledge knowledgeable of the, the school district that a couple of people here have talked about that did not want to even accept the free bottled water that was available to the staff and students at those schools because it would have been admitting uh, some degree of liability for them and they were not willing to do that and kept saying there is no problem. So we need to get this lowered MCL through as quickly as possible and I share the comment of many others here today that getting this done by the end of this year would be optimal. I recognize that it is um, uh, difficult for larger systems and smaller systems alike to install the infrastructure and treatment systems that will be necessary, but they've known this is coming. This is not news to them. And in fact, Soquel Creek Water District in my county has been collecting money um, for a number of years for a treatment system. Uh, they finally had to stop when a judge, at the re request of a ratepayer, pointed out that it was illegal to, to collect money for a system treatment plant that did not exist, but they were allowed to keep that money. So this is not news to these treatment um, people, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear that it has taken so much money to hire expensive consultants. That's the tragedy. But it is part of what the state requires in terms of applications for grant funding. I was very interested to hear the man from Coachella talk about the upgraded um, uh, section 20, or Title 22, 64418, and I looked that up during the break. It talks about the point of use treatment being allowed, but there are many conditions that are confusing, um, and also it, it is all predicated on that the, the system um, administration has applied for funding of some sort. So here we are in these um, really horrible economic times that is not looking good and we're, we're going to um, have to try to make these people find money for, for treatment. So here's, here's the dichotomy. We've got to Becky, get this um, system you're, you're lowered. Over time. All right, I'll finish up and thank you for um, allowing me to speak. We've, we've got to do this, and I believe that in the interest of health of our population, especially our youth, we've got to follow in the steps of Aaron Brockovich and take bold steps and do, just do the right thing. Um, these calculations would also have to meet Prop 218 uh, guidelines when these companies are asking for rate increases from their customers for this. So it all predicate, is predicated on transparency of calculation and I think the white paper lacks in that, especially the table on page eight. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Becky. Next, we're gonna go to Mark Mueller. Uh, Mark, if you're still on the line. Um, actually, uh, Mark, if you'd like to speak, um, you'll need to activate your audio. Uh, right now, we're showing that you have no audio device, so we are unable to unmute you or provide you uh, a, a way to speak. If there's anyone else that would like to comment, uh, please send an email to ddwregunit at waterboards.ca.gov. 
there's a few people in the Zoom room that have still not identified themselves. Uh, it's critical to identify yourselves so that we protect this meeting from Zoom bombing. Uh, so we, we can't give the floor, unfortunately, to individuals who have not identified themselves. This concludes our list for the moment. We're going to go on break. Uh, we'll be available for the next 15 minutes. If users are able to send us an email at ddwregunit at waterboards.ca.gov, then we'll try to let you speak. Thank you. So we're back um, we have Marina West here. Uh, she's calling in from a phone this time. So Marina, I've just unmuted you. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, here we go. Good afternoon. My name is Marina West and I serve as the general manager of the Bighorn Desert View Water Agency. And we serve unincorporated communities of Landers, Johnson Valley, and Flamingo Heights. Our system serves a population that is 100% disadvantaged with 75% are seniors on a fixed income. We're supportive of the state's efforts to establish a methodology for setting MCO for contaminants of emerging concerns, such as hexavalent chromium. But we are concerned about the lack of specifics regarding the water board's approach to setting the MCO as it was written in the white paper. Bighorn may not be affected greatly by an MCL for Chrome 6. However, we are concerned about the precedent set by the board's failure to address the court opinion, which invalidated the previous MCL. 
Additionally, the white paper provides a definition of economic feasibility, but doesn't quite explain how the water board will be testing feasibility. If the board tells us which tools they are using, but doesn't explain how they will use them to determine the MCL level, it seems like we are being left in the dark. My fear is just that a smaller water company like mine could be overlooked if there isn't a more concrete structure provided for how the analysis can help inform feasibility talk. We urge you not to ignore our comments, incorporate them into the paper before the adoption of a formal policy on economic feasibility of safe drinking water standards. We hope the board considers our recommendations on economic feasibility for setting an MCL standard, which can help avert the quote, race to the bottom, unquote, by water systems serving disadvantaged communities who would be defenseless to new regulatory actions. Uh, just uh, note, I hear a lot about point of use, but actually drinking reverse osmosis water is not safe for the body. So we need to be careful about that. And actually, while it's also not drinkable, it can cause severe damage to water system infrastructure if that is where all water systems are headed. So that adds back costs to buffer the water. Thank you for your time. Thank you for calling in for your comment, Marina. We're looking for Judy Cor Lorono. If Judy, if you are in the Zoom room, please raise your hand right now so that we can identify you. So we found um, Judy, uh, she raised her hand as Marina West. However, that account does not have audio activated, so we cannot, um, we cannot let them speak because they, they don't have an audio device. So if, um, if you wanna activate audio, there should be an option to do so on your device if you're, if you're using a smartphone or a computer, uh, that should allow you to speak. Judy, uh, if you're still calling in from the Marina West line, uh, we see that you've activated your audio now, so we are now uh, unmuting you. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Judy Corolarono. I am uh, 
President and Director of Bighorn Desert View Water Agency. We serve approximately 2,500 people that are 100% disadvantaged, and 50% of that 100% is severely disadvantaged. Hold on a second. I'd like to speak to the white paper as asserts that our range of strategies and funding sources available to achieve compliance and offer offset costs of new regulations, grants, low or no interest loans, point of use or point of entry treatment, variances, exemptions, and consolidations. The strategies and funding sources proposed leave small water systems with out many answers. We cannot leave behind the poorest among us. Many small water systems do not have the resources to hire experts to navigate the grant application process, alternatives to grants for financial support to small systems that do not require engagement of expensive consultants and are easy to assess and are urgently needed. The Water Board's Office of Financial Assistance is not transparent about grant qualifications and priorities, causing many water systems that try applying, stranded with rejection letters after having spent thousands for consultants needed in the application project process. Further, small systems do not have resources to implement studies to evaluate alternative treatment options. The State Water Board cannot simply point to alternative compliance mechanisms to establish that a proposed MCL is economically feasible for effective systems without first determining if these options are actually viable for those systems. While we agree that consolidation may be a potential solution for some small water systems, it is not magic, it's not a magic bullet and carries with it significant costs which will likely, likely require state investments to fully activate. The State Water Board needs a strategic plan for financial and technical assistance when adopting each new MCO that run in parallel with enforcement timelines. I just want to refer to <clears throat> the uh, COVID-19 problem that the small, small businesses is only 15% got funds, got funded, and uh, they're having problems, they need help, and they can't get it, and this is just another, could end up being another government boondoggle. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And this concludes the public comment period for today. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that they can still make a written public comment uh, by, by sending a comment letter uh, through the instructions on our website. Um, with that, we're going to open up the, the floor to Darren Polimus from DDW. Thank you, everyone. I just, this is Darren Polimus, Deputy Director for the Division of Drinking Water. I wanted to thank you for your comments. Um, obviously, we'll take those back and uh, continue to work forward on this process. Um, just a reminder that, uh, you know, we separated this out from the MCL to see if it would help to have some general contemplation um, of the, of the uh, economic feasibility, which was the question raised in the courts um, uh, for the, the dismissal of the MCL. So we'll be uh, going forward uh, with our process. Um, everybody gets another chance at this again in the actual APA proceedings uh, as we develop the MCL uh, and it'll obviously have economic feasibility considered specifically uh, for the Chrome 6 components um, as we move that forward. And uh, so your, your comments here uh, will be helpful to us and I'm sure our board members appreciate them to uh, as we move forward. So thank you for making it a successful day. I know it's a difficult but um, important to keep moving ahead on these important issues. And so we really appreciate everyone's cooperation and uh, making it a successful meeting. Thank you.
right, thank you everyone. we're now closing the meeting.